to see you again. Glad I'm feeling better. <laughs> yep. Hallelujah. Yep. Randy's glad I'm feeling better. That means I don't have to sleep out in the recliner. You know? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I suppose it was three weeks ago. Was it three weeks? Maybe long. Three weeks ago, I started. I started teaching on the twenty-third psalm, and you know, it's six little verses. You would think that would be easy to get through. Well, I only got through two, <laughs> two verses of that. So um, I had lots of requests to continue on. I tried to condense the last four at the end, and it deserves more than that. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to continue on in Psalm 23 uh, about the Good Shepherd. Now, the first couple of verses we went through, we talked about Jesus being the Good Shepherd, and the meaning of that word shepherd was in the Hebrew. It actually meant best friend. So we talked about that, that, that Jesus is our best friend. And that was really fun to look into. And then we talked about how he leads us by the still waters into green pastures. He provides for us. God's a good shepherd. Well, this week we're going to start on verse 3. And the first phrase is, he restoreth my soul. And I want to spend a little time on that. He restoreth my soul. Hmm. None of us get through life without having damage done to our soul. That's our mind, our will, and our emotions. Nobody comes to God whole. We all come to God broken. And it's not that God breaks us. Now, I've heard teachers, I've heard people say, well, God will break you. No, God doesn't break you. Life breaks you. Life will break you. Life will tear you down. Life will destroy you if it can. Because the world is fallen. But God comes. And he restores our soul. Huh. You know, again, a lot of teaching, you hear a lot of teaching out there. They talk about renewing your mind and focusing on your work in renewing your mind. The renewal of your mind, yes, you can certainly help if you'll read the word. But the renewal of your mind is God's work. God restores your soul. God restores your mind, your will, and your emotions. When we get saved, now God does miraculous things when we get saved. When we get saved, a miracle happens. You receive the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. But when you, when, after you're saved comes the time when you learn how to use it you have the mind of christ the holy spirit will teach you all things but we don't know how to use it it's it's like oh it's like having a new car or something you know or you're not quite used to it you don't know how it works and so it's God's Holy Spirit teaches us how to navigate with this new vehicle that we have. He restores our soul. Ever, have you ever seen that, that show, American Restoration? Ever watch that? I, I like on the History Channel where they take this old, beat-up antique and they restore it. Or have you ever seen Bud's Pinto? You know, see, this is what God does with our mind and our will and our emotions. He takes something that is old and beat up and junk, something that is good for the trash heap, and he takes that and he restores it to its original, to better than its original purpose. That's what God is doing. That's his work in you. 
He restores my soul. He restores my mind. He changes the way I think. He changes the way I look at people. And as I come to see him differently, I come to see me differently, I come to see you differently because I begin to see him through, your, through his eyes. Hallelujah. He changes my will. Your desires change when you become a believer. You don't want the same things you used to want. Suddenly, you can see sin for what it is, an enemy that will destroy you. Somehow, those things that used to draw us no longer hold a lot of appeal. He can take addiction and, and you're able to see what it is. And it's no longer appealing. You can walk away from it. We have freedom from sin. We have freedom from those things because we have a new mind. We have a new will. And he can restore our emotions. That's a beautiful thing. Because it's in that emotional realm that so many of us need healing. whether it's stuff that happened as we were kids or our relationship with a spouse or, you know, just an anxiety of looking at the world and what's happening. God is able to come in and he is the God of peace. And we can speak Jesus to that situation. And the situation may not even change, but suddenly we are changed. And we can see it for what it is. And we can begin to speak to it. And we truly become the people who turn the world upside down. As we bring Jesus when we come in. He restoreth my soul. The word of God talks about Jesus, God restoring a lot of things. And it's, he restores my soul. And some of the other things it says, he restores he restores the joy of your salvation. That's one thing God restores. You know, I was a believer for a long time before I stumbled on grace. I didn't really stumble on grace, you know. The Holy Spirit began to minister grace to me. And I needed to have the joy of my salvation restored. Because for a long time I lived as a believer, but I was not very joyful because I was busy working, working to earn what I already had. Miserable. I was a miserable believer. Oh, bit of a Pharisee. But thank you, Jesus. I see grace, and I'm delivered from that. So he restored the joy of my salvation. Salvation is exciting again. Walking with God is exciting again. It is, uh, it's a wonderful, it's a breath of fresh air. The opening up the word is a joy because he shows me new things every time. It's, it's wonderful. He ministers his love to me. He restores the joy of my salvation. Um, yeah, here we go. He said he would restore justice. And that's what he did through the blood of Jesus. He restored justice. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes things happen to us and those things were unfair. God, God knows. And he will vindicate you when you've been wrongly accused. And he will vindicate you and bring peace to situations. He has restored justice to his children. Hallelujah. He, it says he restores our health. By his stripes we were healed. He'll restore you to health. That's what he does. He, does it, he says, Beloved, I desire that you be in health and prosper just as your soul prospers. With the renewal, the restoration of your soul comes restoration of your health and restoration of your fortunes. 
He said, I'll restore your fortunes. First Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the Lord of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Hallelujah. Lamentations 5.21, Israel cried out, Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as old. Hallelujah. And Joel 2.25 says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. So God promises to restore to you all of those years, and for me it was a lot of years, all of those years that I believed wrong teaching, all of those years where my belief in Jesus was basically ineffective, I wasn't effective, all those years were stolen from me by religion. God says he's going to restore all those years. The end is going to be better than the beginning. If we are looking forward to good things, not bad. God said he promised he would restore all the years that were stolen from you. I don't know what's been stolen from you. God said he's going to restore it. That's his promise. And just like we heard in the songs, God is faithful and his promises are true. You can take it to the bank. God has promised you he'll restore the years that the canker worm stole. Hallelujah. So good. So, I'll move on just a little bit. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his sake. And I should look the um, Passion Translation words that just a little differently. I wanted to read it that way. So, that's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. He leads me along in his footsteps. How cool is that? You know, I can remember when, when the kids were little, you know, you'd put them on your feet and they'd walk with you. Man, that's what God is doing for you. He is leading you along in his footsteps. You can trust the path you're on. Don't sit there and say, well, I wonder, if I'm, I wonder if I'm walking in the way God wants me to. Yes, you are, because he leads you. He is leading you in his footsteps of righteousness. You are the righteous man. Please, please know that. You are righteous because you are in Jesus. You have been made one with him. The prayers of the righteous man availeth much. Your prayers avail much because you are the righteous man. You are in Christ. And ultimately, he is the righteous man. And you are walking in his footsteps. So at any given time, when you come into a situation where you're unsure or you're uncertain, you can say, Jesus, I'm walking in your footsteps. Show me. Show me what to say. Tell me how to navigate this. And don't struggle. You know, I was thinking about, you know, when the disciples were out on the boat in that storm, 
they were all working, working, working. And said so they toiled all night long trying to keep that boat afloat. And what was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. He was sleeping. All of your toil and your anxiety and your work to try and make things go and keep things afloat, you would be far better to just lay down and rest and let Jesus take care of it. All of your anxiety gains you nothing. All you have to do is, is wake up and speak peace to the situation. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So he leads you along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. You know, I don't know so much. It brings honor to God's name that he would save someone like me. That's where the honor comes from. It's not that what I do so much honors God. I mean, maybe it does. I sure hope it does. But that's not the whole purpose. God didn't call you so that you would bring honor to his name through the things that you do. But we bring honor to his name just by receiving him because he is so gracious and faithful and merciful that he would save us. And that brings honor to his name. That his plan is so far better than what we could achieve. His plan and his purposes are so far above and beyond. And his purpose for you is so far and above anything that you could ask or think. And as we walk in this path of righteousness that he has laid out for us, he receives glory. Because, man, I mean, when the disciples walked on the earth, everyone just went, who is he calling? What is he doing? He didn't go and call the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He didn't call the kings and the princes. He called fishermen and shepherds and prostitutes. That's who he called. He didn't call the best that there was, and yet we are the cream of the crop. See, we look at it and say, well, that's not the best that there was, and God says, no, that's the cream of the crop. And he took the foolish things, he took what the world would call foolish, and he confounded the wise. So he can use this foolish thing and confound the wise. And he delights in that because that brings glory to his name. So don't worry about what kind of vessel you are. Don't worry about whether you're made of gold or wood or straw. Don't worry about what kind of vessel you are. Just know that when the king uses it, the vessel has value. doesn't matter what you're made of. It's that the king uses you. That's where your value lies. The king values you. Huh, you know, when, what, what causes something to have value? Well, it's the value you put on it. You know, I could have a Picasso painting in my house. Have you seen Picasso paintings? I would not value it very highly. Right now, I've got this drawing that Kinsley made for me. <laughs> That's hanging on my fridge. Don't try and take my drawings. <laughs> you know, here, take the Picasso, but you can't have this. It's the value I place on it. See, and your value is not made because of you, what you're made of, who you are, what you do. Your value is decided by what the king has placed on you. See, your value was decided when Jesus went to the cross 
your value is decided because Jesus said, this person is worth my life. Hallelujah. Why did I get on that? I don't know. Not in my notes. Thank you, Jesus. Someone needed to hear that. So he guides us into righteousness. He protects his name. You know, he has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I love the fact that God watches over his word to see that it is fulfilled. That God is faithful, that we can look at his word and know that it's true. And it's not just true for these people who walked at that time. It's true for us today. God does, is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't look at the king and say the king is more value than, valuable than the, you know, the poor man at the door. The, man who, the rich man who lived in the house was not more valuable to God than Lazarus at the gate. God loved them both. God loves us all the same. And what he'll do for one person, he'll do for another. I talked a little bit, you know, in verse 4, it says, Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me, for you already have. That's in the Passion Version. Fear will not conquer me, for you already have. I love that. See, I used to be a very fearful person. I lived in, I thought about fear. I lived in fear. I, you know, I was afraid of, oh man, so many things. And, and I just, that's not even, the, fear doesn't cross my thoughts anymore. Because I've surrendered to God. I've put my, hand, my life in his hands. You know, and, and I've, been, I've been close enough to death. You know, death, ultimately all of our fear comes from fearing death. That's, that's the basis of all fear. It's fear of death. You know, as a believer, we don't fear death. What's death? Death is just a second, a blip. Because once we leave this body to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We don't have to fear death because we'll never taste it. We'll never taste death. This body may die, but I'll never taste it. This body may experience pain, but, but my spirit will be whole. And someday I'll be free of this earth suit. Hallelujah! Man, you know, that's Paul said, I don't know what's better. I mean, Man, to, it'd be better for me to go, but man, there's stuff I have to do here. But man, it'd be better for me to go. So, you know, so death is not something the believer needs to fear. Now, it's not anything you want to rush towards either, but it's not anything to fear. So fear has no hold on me because I've already surrendered to God. I really like the way the Passion says that. <clears throat> Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me, for you already have. You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely, for you are near. Hallelujah. Perfect love cast out all fear. You are a product of perfect love. We're a product of perfect love. The love of God, perfect love has been shed abroad in our hearts. God has not given us a spirit of fear. God's Holy Spirit is not a spirit of fear. It is a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. You have been given God's Holy Spirit. You have been made one 
with God's Holy Spirit. And that is not a spirit of fear. It is a spirit of power. Deutimus. Dynamite. That's the power you have as God's child. You have a spirit of power. You can be an influencer. You can walk in this life and change things just by trusting Jesus, just by bringing Jesus into the situation. You have great power because you walk in perfect love. Every person on the planet is looking for that. Every person on the planet wants to experience the unconditional love that God has poured into you. And God will show you how to pour it out of you. So that when you walk into a room, every spirit in there will stand up and take attention. The atmosphere in a room will change when you walk into it, and not in a bad way. You bring the authority and the love and the power of God with you into every situation. Hallelujah. And you have a sound mind. You are not double-minded. You are not a double-minded person. Everything that God is, he has made you. If you can describe Jesus in a way, that's how you can describe yourself. When we say God is a faithful God, we can also say I am a faithful person. When we say God is a loving God, we can also say I am a loving person. We say God is full of mercy. I am full of mercy. God is patient. I am patient. Because all of those things are fruit of his spirit, which he has given to you because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And it's yours in full. You don't get just a little bitty piece. You're not a little bitty baby spirit. You have the spirit of God himself residing in you, full grown, full of power, full of love, a sound mind, focused. I don't care if they've said you're ADHD or whatever or post-traumatic stress syndrome, whatever, forget that. You have a new diagnosis and it's a sound mind that belongs to you because of Jesus. It belongs to you, it's yours. Speak that over yourself and thank Jesus for it because he provided it. There, are good, there will be times when the enemy will try and confuse you. Stand against it. Just say, no, I'm not a confused person. I have a sound mind because Jesus lives within me. And his thinking is straight. His thinking is correct. Thank you, Father, you give me your thoughts. And see, I always know, I always know, when I get a really good idea, I know that's not coming from me. <laughs> you know, give God credit when he gives you those great ideas because you don't come up with it by yourself. Give God credit. Thank him. Man, thank you, Father. I mean, you recognize, you know, because so many times... Don't we go, you know, you just get the idea, maybe I shouldn't do this. And so you don't. Who knows what you avoided? Thank God. Thank God for that. Thank you, Father. You protect me because you have given me the mind of Christ. And I'm your sheep. I hear your voice. And in others, I will not follow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is so wonderful that we have Jesus, the good shepherd. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. 
I really like that in the Passion Translation, verse 4. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. See, now maybe you guys don't understand this, but for me, understanding and really grasping the idea that God actually loved me, that was hard for me. I mean, I know, yeah, God's love, but that he really loved me, I had a problem with that. Because I didn't love me very much. And I couldn't understand how God, I mean, God, how could he love me? But when I understand grace, suddenly I can understand that God loves me. It doesn't matter. He's not loving me because of what I can do or what I don't do. He just loves me. He adores me. He's got my picture on his mantle. He keeps it in his, in his billfold. Here, this is my kid. He, God loves you that way. His thoughts about you are more than the sands on the seashore. That's, how many, that's God's thoughts towards you continually. Now, how God is able to think about each and every individual one of us at the same time, I don't know. But it says he does. His thoughts are towards us continually. He knows the very hairs on your head, or not on your head. <laughs> he knows where they went. That's one of the restoring things we're counting on, right? <laughs> but that's how much he loves us. He keeps our tears in a bottle. He sees every tear you've shed. He's counted it all. He knows everything about you. He is crazy in love with us. We are his passion. And it's his love that brings us comfort. I'm comforted by his love. I'm comforted. I don't have to be afraid of him. I don't have to worry about what I'm doing or not doing. I can just be in his presence and overwhelmed by his love. And it's just perfectly okay. You know, that day when he said to me, I never ask you for anything. I never ask you to do anything. And if you don't do another thing for me for the rest of your life, I'm perfectly good with that. You're my daughter. Blew me away. Because God is not demanding anything from you. He's not demanding that you do anything. He just wants you to be really comforted by his love. By his love for you. Not by your love for other people. He wants you to be comforted by his love. Hallelujah. Change of mindset brings us great peace. I'll never be lonely, for you are near. Verse 5. We'll wrap this up pretty quick here. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know... You don't sit down at a banquet table in the middle of the battle. You know that? In the middle of the battle, you're not sitting at the banqueting table as the guest of honor. You know what that tells me? That tells me the battle's already won. That we are invited to a victory feast. And our enemies are off on the sideline, just looking on because they're not invited. But God suddenly switches from the idea of sheep and shepherd. He switches to the idea of a king. And he brings you in as his honored guest. He's not bringing you in as the servant serving the wine and the cheese. 
you are the guest of honor at God's table. Your enemies are defeated, and God has prepared a table for you, a banquet for you. Anything you need, he provides. Everything you need, he provides. You're the guest of honor. He clothes you in robes of righteousness. And he sits you at the right hand in Christ Jesus at the banqueting table. Wow. The battle's already won. The war's over. It's time to enjoy the presence of the king. Hallelujah. And the passion version says, you become my delicious feast, even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. Our cup runneth over. We become a river of living water that pours out life to everyone around us. Hallelujah. That's what God, our good shepherd, our best friend does. He brings life to us and he pours it through us. Our cup runneth over. Verse 6. So, in the Passion Version, it says, So why would I fear the future? Why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterwards, when my life is through, I will return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. Hallelujah. Why do we fear the future? Why do we let anything trouble us and worry us? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Righteousness is going before me, and goodness and mercy are following me. He's leading me in righteousness. I'm stepping in his footprints of righteousness. And his goodness and his mercy is following me. I can't lose. You can't lose. The God of the universe is going before you, preparing a way. He says the hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. There are no obstacles in front of you. God is going before you with his righteousness. He's preparing a way for you to succeed. And man, if we mess up along the way, goodness and mercy are there to pick up the slack. They're picking up after me. Oh, hallelujah. Goodness. Goodness follows you everywhere you go. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the promise that you reside with us forever, that your goodness and your mercy follow us, your righteousness goes before us. Father, thank you. We have no fear. We have no need to fear because your love comforts us. Father, help us remember that you are our good shepherd, our good friend. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And Father, we thank you that we thank you that you love us and you care for us. Father, we thank you for the food that